Desmond Bryan stepped into the office with a heavy sigh. Frowning at the shark-like grin his boss, John Mason, was flashing him. The smile was large and obscene and made Desmond extremely nervous. He'd been summoned from the basement hovel and called an office up to the hallowed halls of the top floor, and that could only mean one thing. He was about to be handed another shitty assignment. Come in, come in. John said, his toothy grin growing wider. Take a seat, Desmond, my boy, take a seat. With another sigh, Desmond plunked himself down at John's desk, but said nothing, glaring at his boss with an open dislike. At this, John burst out laughing. How's the new office, he said, lighting up a cigar and blowing luxurious clouds of smoke into the air. You settling in all right? It's a goddamn shithole, Desmond snapped, and you know it. And you shouldn't have been a bad boy. John replied, blowing a cloud of acrid-smelling smoke right into Desmond's face. Bringing in to a crime scene is an arrestable offense. If I hadn't pulled the right strings, you could have been looking at some serious time. You pulled strings to cover your ass. Story of the century, he said. Do whatever it takes to get the scoop. Your words, not mine. But you broke the cardinal rule, John replied, pointing a nicotine-stained finger in Desmond's face. You got caught, son. You got caught. And you, and so you punish me by taking me off the paper and having me report for that, that shitty-ass magazine of yours, Bigfoot, and Flying Saucers, Mutant Babies, Dog Boys, the whole thing is a joke. That shitty magazine, as you call it, John said, slamming a meaty hand on his desk, is where I got my start. I built it myself from the ground up, from nothing. And it still sells more copies a month than that Daily Teller does a week. You can think of it as a demotion if you like, but I tell you, it's more of a cooling off period. The board wanted your ass. And if, I, and if you weren't such a good reporter, I'd have handed it to them. But you're on shaky ground, boy. You just better believe you're on shaky ground. Okay, Desmond said, slumping his shoulders in defeat. I guess I... I guess a thank you is in order. No, is that? John said, chewing the end of his cigar furiously. I didn't quite catch you. Thank you, Desmond said again, with as much grace as he could muster. It's goddamn better. Now let's get down to business. You're going on a trip. All expenses paid. Desmond looked up suspiciously. A trip? To where? The States. Economy class, all the way. Jesus, not another hunt for Bigfoot, John, please. No, John said, removing a large file from his desk and tossing it to Desmond. Mothman, actually. Desmond ignored the file and looked at his boss incredulously. Mothman. You're kidding me. Not at all, John replied, easing his bulk back into his chair. Don't you follow the news? Reappearing about 60 miles outside of Point Pleasant near Hawking State Park. It was spotted at some old campground near Rose Lake. Campground burned to the ground a few days later. Luckily, it was off-season. Only a couple of old-timers got broiled. All over Fox News Network. Sightings of some strange creature gliding above the flickering flames. That and some grain or grainy cell phone footage of flickering lights in the sky just up our street, wouldn't you say? And to be honest, I'm not sure how you missed it. You know goddamn well how I missed it. I was stuck in, in Bodmin Moor, freezing my ass off, investigating another sighting of the beast of Bodmin. And what did I get for my trouble? A frozen dick and near case of hypothermia. You win some, you lose some. John shrugged. My contact in the state says this one is legit. It says he has proof. Proof. Desmond laughed. Proof that Mothman actually exists. And who is this contact of yours? Some drunken hillbilly? High on paint fumes and moonshine? Actually, no, John said, lighting up another foul-smelling cigar. My contact used to work right here, exactly where you are now. It was a reporter for the Believer. But he was a real hothead and with a big mouth. Getting like you are, actually. But not half as good at his job, so I fired his ass. He moved to the States not long after. 
But an asshole is an asshole in any country. He didn't do too well there either. So he set himself up as a freelancer. And he called you up, Desmond said, raising a quizzical eyebrow. Why? Money, of course, why else? And he thinks you'll pay him for this so-called evidence. Uh, what is this evidence, anyway? Not really sure, John replied, scratching his stubby chin. He wouldn't say. Then why the hell should we listen to him? Sounds like a wild goose chase to me. I'll tell you why, John replied. Because he won't take a flat payment for this proof of his. No matter how much I've offered, he turned it down. Said he wants 50% of all sales from the Believer that month. And 50% of all follow-up articles and interviews hereafter. 50%? What the hell has he got? Now that, John said, leaning over his desk hungrily, is what you're going to find out. The next day, Desmond stepped on the flight BB-3A, heading to Port Columbus International Airport. There he would be picked up by John's U.S. contact and ex-employee who would drive him the 180 miles to Hawking State Park, where the last sighting of the Mothman had been seen. The flight was a long one, over 12 hours overnight, economy class all the way, but Desmond didn't intend to waste them. He had John's file and his promise that if the story paid off, Desmond could take his rightful place as head reporter of the Daily Teller, and all the perks that came with it. Finishing his drink, Desmond fished out his glasses from his jacket pocket, snapped open the file, and began to read. The first sightings of the creature that would become to be known as Mothman occurred in West Virginia in a small backwater town named Clennanen. Five men digging a grave in a local cemetery saw the creature fly low over some nearby trees. They tried to apprehend the creature, but it seemed to vanish into thin air. Shortly after, on November the 15th, two couples from Point Pleasant described a winged creature with glowing red eyes and enormous wings that repeatedly flew over their car and chased them all the way back to town. Over the next few days, there were numerous sightings of the same creature in and around the local area. On December 15th, 1967, the Mothman was sighted again, circling the silver bridge that soon thereafter collapsed killing 46 people, giving rise to the Mothman legend as a harbinger of doom. Desmond flicked impatiently through the rest of the file, but it was more of the same. Drunken hillbillies with wild stories, and a few grainy pictures that could be anything from a kid's kite to a crane, or even a simple barn owl. Either way, Desmond was far from convinced. Just then, his cell phone let out a shrill cry and began to vibrate in his pocket. Much to the annoyance of the old spinster that sat next to him, who raised one thin, quizzical eyebrow as he fumbled his phone out of his pocket before hitting the receive button. Go for Desmond, he said into his phone, all the while flashing his best PR smile for the old girl who was now sipping her second screwdriver. His smile was not returned. Hello, Desmond said again. Is that you, John? But there was nothing. Only a deafening silence. Desmond shrugged and was just about to hang up when a high-pitched shriek shri drilled through the phone, causing him to cry out as he thrust his phone away, shoulders hunched in pain as he pawed at his ear. God damn, son of a bitch, he hissed, looking at his phone and holding it gingerly as if it had turned into some kind of venomous snake. He could hear something now, a kind of sibilant whisper drifting from the phone, causing his skin on his arm to break out in great knots of goose flesh, making his scalp feel tight and uncomfortable. He slowly raised the phone back to his ear. Go back! The words hissed through the phone. Go back! Your future is still unwritten! The words were barely formed, garbled and strained gasping into Desmond's ear. Hold back. Or it's too late. Who is this? Desmond asked, his voice shaking, a cold sweat running down the back of his neck. Who the hell is this? But the line already clicked dead, abruptly, ending the connection. And just then, the plane buffered hard to the left, and a shadow seemed to flit across the moon. Desmond fell back into his chair, eyes tight shut as the turbulence rocked the cabin to and fro. Grainy pictures of the Mothman burned into his brain. Forty-six dead. The silver bridge a mangle of iron and steel. 
cold river water, 46 dead, two missing. When a stewardess laid a gentle hand on his shoulder, he had just managed to bite back a scream. Eight hours later, Desmond stood outside of Port Columbus Airport, his collar turned up against the cold winter drizzle, waiting for John's U.S. contact, a man with the unfortunate name of Percy Titmore, to pick him up. The man was already 30 minutes late, but Desmond was glad of it. The flight had been a real stinker with turbulence and sick bags galore. He had left the flight, but now he was simply pissed. He didn't mind attending that strange phone call that had freaked him out, but now he was, he was back in charge of his whirring emotions. He understood everything. The call had been a hoax, probably cooked up by this Percy character. Small show before the main event. Something to warm up the crowd, you might say. Desmond smiled and crushed out his smoke. If this son of a bitch wanted to play games, well, that was fine. Desmond could play games, too. Just then, a small Honda pulled up to the curb, and a scrawny man, probably in his mid-thirties, with a shock of red hair and freckles, hopped out and approached. You Desmond Bryan? That's, that's me, Desmond said, shaking the offered hand. Good deal, the man said. I'm Percy Titmore. You're late, Desmond replied, looking at his watch. Yeah, sorry about that. You landed right in the middle of rush hour, and your traffic was terrible, my man. Just terrible. Uh, mom's picking up their kids, a whole nine yards. Desmond grunted at this and threw his overnight bag into the back of the car. We better get going, then, he said, climbing to the passenger seat. There we have a long drive ahead of us. Yeah, Percy replied, ignoring Desmond's hostile tone. 180 miles to the Hawking Hills and a couple miles up the old creek trail. We should be arriving at Rose Lake Campsite, or what's left of it anyway, just before dark. Why there? Desmond asked. Is that where your so-called proof is? Percy ignored that. No, uh, my contact, the one with the proof as you put it, lives close by. So what is it? John said you wouldn't tell him. That's right, Percy said, an edge creeping into his voice. And I'm not telling you either. Besides, you wouldn't believe me anyway. You just sit back there and enjoy the ride. You're going to see something, all right, he said, a particularly nasty smile playing across his lips. You're going to be blown away. The rest of the journey was spent mostly in silence. It was just after sunset when the two men arrived at Rose Lake Campsite. Desmond could not keep the shock off his face as he looked around the devastation. God damn, he whispered looking around the charred trees and blackened cabins. Someone did a real job on this place. Yep, Percy replied, handing him a large flashlight. Thank God it happened in winter. If it had been summer, the whole forest would be gone up like a tinderbox. Isn't this technically a crime scene? Desmond said, looking around for a warning sign or police tape. Nope, Percy replied, pulling on a heavy jacket. The whole thing was written off as a freak accident. The investigating team surmised it started with one of the cabins, probably by a forgotten cigarette or such. And boom, whole place went up. So no arson, Desmond sighed. No oily rag or empty canister of gas. Doesn't make for much of a story, does it? Percy shrugged and clicked on his flashlight, beckoning Desmond to follow as he headed up the trail. Campsite is not what we're interested in, he said over his shoulder as he headed deeper into the woods. Desmond followed closely. He was a city boy, born and bred. The looming trees and growing shadows made him nervous. No? He said. Not the campsite. Mothman. Shh, Percy said, rounding on him. Best not to say the name after dark. Some names have power. Desmond noticed the tremor in his voice and the way Percy's hand kept playing with his waistband as if seeking comfort. Percy, what you got there? Protection. Percy titted, lifting up his shirt, revealing the biggest hand cannon that Desmond had ever seen. Percy, Desmond said, trying to keep his voice calm. Why would you need a gun? You will see. Before this night is through, you're going to see and understand a lot more than you ever thought possible. Come on, he said, hurrying up the trail. Another 20 minutes and we'll be there. For a moment... Desmond considered heading back down the trail, but only for a fleeting moment. His curiosity was piqued, 
Whatever was going on here, there was a story of some kind. Desmond wanted to hear it. Twenty minutes later, the two men emerged into a clearing in the woods. There was a large cabin here, and Desmond surmised correctly that he belonged to Percy's mysterious contact. The cabin was a long, single-story affair with a wooden porch that ran the length of the house. There was a light on, and as Desmond drew near, he noticed an old timer sat in a rocking chair with what looked like a loaded shotgun across his lap. Hey, Bobby! Percy yelled. It's us! Don't shoot, okay? Now, who the hell's that? Bobby said, slamming open the porch door and aiming a shotgun into the darkness. That you, Percy? Come into the light where I can see you. Just take it slowly, Percy whispered into Desmond's ear. Old Bobby's as nervous as an Alabama tick, and with good reason, he said, scanning the dark skies. Better get inside and get this business done. What business? Desmond was tempted to ask but Percy was already climbing the porch steps, hands held high. Desmond followed suit, raising his hands way above his head as he entered the dimly lit porch. Close the door, Peckerwood, the old man said, eyeing Desmond closely. Desmond did as he was bid, keeping a wary eye on the shotgun that seemed to track his every movement. When the door was firmly shut, the old man seemed to relax, and with a sigh, flopped back down into his chair but Desmond noticed his hand shook as he placed the shotgun nearby. Jesus, Percy, he said, mopping at his brow with a gnarled hand. Told you I wanted this shit done before dark. It was back again last night. Son of a bitch killed old Boomer. Who the hell is old Boomer? Desmond asked, wondering what he got himself into. Shut your mouth, Limey, the old man snarled. No one's talking to you. Now, fuck that, Desmond replied hotly. This guy is the only one with the money, so you two had better start talking sense or I walk. Percy and Bobby exchanged a glance. All right, Mr. Man, Bobby said, climbing to his feet. You want to know? I'll show you what you're getting for the money. Tell me. Follow me. Percy, you still packing heat? Percy gave him a nod and pulled his piece. All right, then. You dig up the rear and you watch the sky. Desmond could have laughed then, but he could also feel the fear emanating from the two men. Feel it crawl over his skin like biting insects. Okay, Bobby said, as he rounded the side of the house and entered the overgrown backyard, dominated by a crumbling building that once served as some sort of barn. Here it is, city boy, he said, pointing to a piece of blood-soaked tarpaulin amongst the long grass. Go take your look. Desmond approached slowly, his heart thudding in his ears as he reached down and ripped the tarpaulin away, revealing the devastation beneath. It was a dog, or what was left of one. Desmond took one look at that bloody ruin and staggered away, drawing a deep breath as he fought with his twisted stomach. That's old Boomer, Bobby said. What's left of him, anyway? Jesus, Desmond said, turning back to take another look. What could have done that? His face is gone. It's just the bone. He saw drawing a shuddering breath. It's melted. Some kind of acid, Bobby replied, covering over the remains. Boomer was a good old boy. He, he didn't deserve to go out like that. This is crazy. You're both fucking crazy, Desmond yelled, suddenly furious. First that bullshit phone call, then this, he said, pointing an accusing finger at the bloody heap. But that was as far as he got. The butt of Bobby's rifle hit him hard in the guts, causing him to fall to his knees as he fought for breath. Are you saying I kill my own dog, you cornhole and son of a bitch? Bobby said, grabbing him up by the collar and dragging him across the yard towards the barn. Percy, get the door, goddammit. We're going to show this city boy what's what. Percy glanced at the sky nervously, then quickly unlocked a huge, rusty-looking padlock before dragging the grating door open. Vic the light on, Percy, Bobby said, dragging the protesting Desmond across the threshold. And lock the door behind you. Percy hit a nearby switch, then slammed the door closed, dropping a large wooden bar into place immediately. And the whole barn was lit up. 
At first, Desmond was not sure what he was seeing. It looked to be some kind of multicolored canvas stretched across the width of the barn. It took a moment for his tired mind to comprehend what he was seeing. There was a wing covered in fine hair that seemed to crawl and undulate with a mind of its own, its colors swirling, mesmerizing. Mother of God, he whispered, climbing to his feet. It's real. It can't be real. But it is, Percy sighed. And it wants it back. That and this, he said, dropping something heavy into Desmond's hand. Desmond looked down. There was some sort of pouch. The leather looked terrifyingly familiar. Skin crawling as if in a dream, he untied the ancient thread and emptied the contents into the palm of his hand. Knuckle bones, Bobby said. Human. Do you the engravings? Desmond said nothing. His mouth agape, the bones were black with age and engraved with runic symbols that made his mind ache just to look at them. Take him, he said, thrusting the pouch back at Percy, who only nodded stuff in the blackened bones back inside, before drawing it firmly shut. Desmond jerked forward as if drawn by an invisible string. As he reached out a trembling hand towards the waiting wing, and gently stroking the fine hair, the wing immediately convulsed, sending him scurrying back with a startling cry. Suddenly he was aware of the looming night like never before. He could almost feel its oppressive weight pushing down on the barn roof. Jesus, he clamored at Bobby. You said it's been back? That it killed Boomer? Yeah, the old man said. I heard Boomer barking. He was at the back door going wild, trying to get in. Boomer went nuts, barking and snarling. He charged the godforsaken thing, but it flew away. Thought it was gone, and then it came out of nowhere and snatched poor old Boomer up. I managed to get off a shot at it, and it dropped Boomer. But as you saw, there wasn't much left of him, my man. The wing. Desmond was frantic now. Ha ha. How did you get it? How did it take Boomer with only one wing? You were another one by my guess. As for how it got it in the first place, I blew it off with this, he said, hefting his shotgun. I was in bed when my chicken started flapping and causing a terrible commotion. Grabbed up my shotgun, headed outside. Expected to see a fox, but it weren't no fox, it was that thing. Top of the coop had been torn clean off. And it was in there, amongst them. It must have heard me come in panic, try to fly away, but it somehow managed to get itself all tangled up in the chicken wire and it managed to get off a shot. Now it screamed then, just like a, like a banshee. It managed to tear itself free and shamble off into the woods. Not for leaving that behind. He nodded towards the wing. Shed it, just like a lizard shedding its tail. And a bag? Desmond asked. Found that the next day amongst the wreckage. Locked them both away in the barn. Gave old Percy a call. Told me that he could make a shit ton of money from this and that, and he had contacts back in the UK, and that's you, I'm guessing. And now you have seen it, and let's talk money. I don't know what kind of arrangements you have with Percy, and I don't care. I want it gone from my property, so I'm willing to cut you a good deal. I want 20000 and it's all yours. Done, Desmond said immediately. Shit. Bobby muttered. Should have asked for more. I'll write you a check right now. Desmond said, reaching into his pocket for the company checkbook. A deal with that, Bobby said, raising a shotgun. I want cash tonight, or will I burn the damn thing and be done with the whole sorry affair? How do you expect me to get twenty grand in cash tonight? Desmond asked, his frustration mounting. Well, that's your affair, Bobby replied, herding them out of the barn at gunpoint. Just get it done. I want... But that was as far as he got. Suddenly, a great shadow swooped down from the sky, and there was a deafening tearing noise, like a sharp blade cutting through paper. Bobby's head hit the floor in a shower of blood, bone, and gristle. His body convulsed, discharging both barrels into Desmond's shoulders, spinning him around, his face crashing into the hard-packed earth. 
Desmond screamed and flopped over, his hand going to the terrible wound, trying to staunch the hot flow of scalding blood. Shots rang out as Percy made a run for the house. He fired his pistol blindly into the air, leaping for the porch in a big, comical stride. The gun clicked empty, but Percy kept firing and screaming. His foot made the first step of the porch, and then a shadow engulfed him. And he was lifted, howling and gibbering high into the air. Before suddenly dropping, cartwheeling towards the ground, he hit the cabin roof with a sickening thud before bouncing down and onto the stone-packed earth. His face and upper torso covered in a foul-smelling slime that smoked and bubbled at his flesh. Desmond staggered to his feet, waves of dizziness assaulting his senses. His heart thudded in his ears as he frantically tried to escape the devastation and madness all about him. He was halfway across the yard, exhausted and bleeding, when there was a tremendous thud. Something heavy landed behind him. He tried to turn, but his frozen body would not allow it. He was only vaguely aware of the hot piss that ran down his leg as the shadow loomed above him. You should not have come. The Mothman screeched, not from a mouth, not designed for human. His loathsome breathing spattering the back of Desmond's neck. I warned you not to come. Suddenly, there was a searing pain as a clawed hand burst through his chest in a welter of blood and shattered bone. Desmond's hands fell upon that terrible hand as if still not sure of its existence. Then, excruciatingly slowly, it was withdrawn. Desmond fell to the ground in a tangled heap his vision fading as the Mothman's glowing eyes chased him down into eternity. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching tonight's video. Or watching tonight, or listening to tonight's podcast, because it's also a podcast on Spotify, or on Apple, or on Google, or anywhere else you can listen to it podcast. So, as you know, uh, just about every single convention this year has been cancelled. However, there is something fun that I think all of you might like, and that's the HorrorCon VR. HorrorCon VR is a project that I've picked up with, as well as a group of my friends, to help become a reality. HorrorCon VR is going to be hosted in VR chat, and you don't need a headset or virtual reality to be able to play it. You just need a computer or laptop. So if you guys are interested in finding out more, you can head over to HorrorConVR.com or you can check us out on Twitter at Horror underscore VR. And lastly, as always, I want to remind you guys, if you ever want to support the show, you can do so at Patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta. And I really appreciate any time you guys can support the show because honestly, I love you guys. <laughs> You're all awesome. So. But a very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez. Ha ha sa ha. Ken Lenda Higuchi, Mazakin, Champinsky, The Red Oak Shield Virus, G Weevil 3, Diana Krause, Stephen Van Huss, Chance Burnett, Tristan Pelton, Nico Cow, The Ginger Bros, Last Blade Song, Caleb Dougal, Sky Harbor, The Homeless Bird 93, Bobby Karen, Liam Newman, Aaron Stormcrow, Barbara Maceo, Thomas Burgett, S Man, Kiri the Sloth, Bad Honey, Someone You Love, Said the King 56, Shadow Morningstar, Mad Marshtomp, Mr. Thud, Patrick Schoolmeister, Z. Kearley, Wolfie Nums, Rafael Rodriguez, W.R. Axis, Prozac and Pancakes, Mike Bullock, Acid System, Lauren, Brian Arse, and Rumble Fox. And also a huge thank you to everybody who's down there in the description down below. You guys, as always, are the real MVPs, and I appreciate you more than I can possibly say. So thank you guys, thank you all for listening, and sweet dreams.